Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, Andrew. Um, yeah, well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Miguel Duarte, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Kike, and we are presenting a talk titled Cuber VMs All the Way Down, a custom-sized uh, networking solution for inceptionist clusters. It's a weird name, but this mostly aims to explain the requirements, goals, and a little bit the implementation details of a CNI plugin for the cluster API uh, Hubert. Uh, we are both, we both work for Red Hat. Uh, we're members of the OpenShift virtualization networking team. And for those of you that don't know, that's a downstream distribution of the Kubevert uh, project and its uh, ecosystem. So, uh, well, let's kick off with the agenda. Next slide, please. Whoops, too many. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, so we will begin with a quick introduction of what Cluster API provider Kubevert is and also of the Oven Kubernetes uh, projects. Once we have those two uh, concepts clear, those two projects clear, we will explain why we want to mix and match them and uh, use Oven Kubernetes to provide ACNI. Uh, well, the networking solution that we wanna have. We will then explain the goals for this CNI plugin and then uh, I'll, I'll pass the baton over to Kike and he will drive us through the technical details of the solution and show us the demo. I'll then finalize with uh, some conclusions and next steps for the work we've done. Next slide, please. Oh, that's one too many. Okay, thanks. So. In order for me to explain what Cluster API provider Qvert is, I first need to give spend a few seconds explaining what Cluster API is. Like in their own words, it's a declarative Kubernetes style API to create, configure, and manage Kubernetes clusters. What this does is actually, well, just that, just provision Kubernetes clusters. And in a way like you would use like any automation tool like Ansible or Terraform or stuff like that, you can use this tool to, uh, well, create and provision Kubernetes clusters. Now, the thing about provider Kubert is that the Kubernetes nodes will actually be implemented as, well, Kubert virtual machines that will be running on what we call the management cluster. Uh, I'll try to explain why is this relevant and why would you use this? So. One of the things is cluster scale. So I don't think it's quite common for uh, you to see um, like very dense clusters with tens of thousands of nodes or even thousands of nodes. It's quite more common to see smaller clusters that are interconnected. So having a cheap cluster provisioner that gives you on-demand clusters in a uh, portable way, well, it's very helpful for that. Another use case that we have is for CI. Let's say that you want to test something like a Kubernetes feature or something. You have like a very cheap way to just provision your cluster, check your feature, see the results, tear it down in the end. I've linked here like a presentation from last year in the, in the well, in the Kubert Summit about this project and you can find a whole lot more information there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now OVN. Uh, OVN stands for Open Virtual Network, and it is uh, an SDN control plane. So what it does, well, it's an SDN control plane, and it will have Open vSwitch as the SDN data plane in a way. So what it gives us is provide an higher level of abstraction than the thing Open vSwitch does. So you program Open vSwitch using OpenFlow, but we don't want to manage OpenFlow. You want to use this, this, these uh, higher layer of abstractions, like these Oven logical entities, and Oven will then compile OpenFlow and it will install this OpenFlow into the relevant nodes in the system, thus achieving the kind of networking that you want to have. So as examples, Oven provides uh, logical constructs like logical switches that will interconnect your workloads, logical routers that will interconnect your logical switches, ACLs that uh, dictate 
who gets access to what and under what conditions. And all those oven constructs will in the end be compiled to OpenFlow. And that OpenFlow will be installed into the data plane and well, traffic will just flow in the way you configure it. Now, this explains oven. Oven Kubernetes is in turn a CNI plugin built exactly for Kubernetes. So it, it uses, it understands the Kubernetes API and provides an opinionated topology. So in a way, it, for as an example, you have like for each node in the system, you have like a logical switch that will interconnect all the workloads on that node. And all these logical switches on each of the nodes will be interconnected by, by a logical router. So this provides a set of opinionated topologies that will be used and its goal in a way, well, exactly its goal is to translate from Kubernetes objects into oven logical entities. So for instance, whenever you uh, provision a network policy, oven Kubernetes will create a set of ACLs and uh, point them to your workloads, does um, implementing the policy. Same thing for services, it will create a set of load balancers and configure them accordingly so you can access the uh, Kubernetes services. Uh, next slide, please. And now we reach the part of the motivation. Like, why do we want to mix these two technologies? So we want to solve one particular problem with this. And that problem is we want to be able to upgrade the management cluster without disrupting the work, the, the tenant workloads that are being executed in the host of clusters. So we want to update the management cluster and we want the customer workloads not to be disrupted in any visible way. That's our utmost goal. Uh, what we have right now uh, is not good enough. For instance, let's take the masquerade binding that we use in the virtual machines. So that does masquerade inside of the pod. So that means that the IP address that you have inside of the pod is not the IP address of the pod. Actually, I mean that the IP address inside of the VM is not the IP address of the pod. And so that's not good enough for Kubelet. Kubelet would go insane with that. Uh, with bridge binding, what happens when you migrate is that once you migrate to the target node, like your gateway configuration would need to be updated. And that's also not good enough for us. We want to do this seamless without having to reconfigure on the destination. For that, we need to provide an answer via uh, CNI. And we're since we want to have like a, a near seamless migration, like without disruption, we want we look at what's being done in other projects. And we've seen that, uh, for instance, projects like OpenStack uh, rely on Oven to provide very minimal downtime when migrating things like using its latest um, improvements. There's a link here with a talk about exclusively or specifically about those improvements. They achieve like a downtime of around 100 milliseconds, which is something we would like to have. Uh, with this, we can move into the goals for our CNI. Thanks, Kike. Uh, okay, so as taking a step back, Remember, our goal is to be able to migrate the, well, what the Kubert virtual machine, which in essence is a Kubernetes node without impacting the TCP connections it has opened. For instance, kubelet cannot be impacted. Like there's a running kubelet on in that, uh, in that virtual machine and its connections cannot be impacted. It must survive the migration. Same thing for the workloads that are running and being managed by that kubelet on that particular node. And for this to happen, we want to have like the mi most minimal downtime as possible. Another thing we need, as I said before, we need to achieve like consistent IP and gateway configuration across the migration. So the destination and well, the source and target nodes, like the both the IP and the gateway configuration must uh, be persistent and must be the same after it, be mostly because well, he was bound to it and we can't afford to reconfigure it. That would lead to a, the, connect, the TCP connections to break. Another thing we want to have is to isolate the, these uh, hosted cluster networks. So this means that the uh, stuff running on an hosted cluster can only access things on other hosted clusters on or other infra components via uh, pub, public load balancers. 
This is to say that unless anything is exposed, it will only be accessible within its own hosted cluster. And um, these poly load balancers must be of type, must be Kubernetes services of type, both of type node port and load balancer. And with this, going to hand this so keep this all over to Kike and he will drive us through the implementation details and then with a demo. Hello, uh, so I'm going to talk about the implementation uh, from a big picture is just uh, some points like at the end we have found that the, the easiest way, is, way to have like out of the box features like services is to go with the cluster default network uh, one of the main points is like instead of uh, setting the IP configuration in the pod with the CNI, we skip that in OVN Kubernetes with the changes we have to. And what we do is just configure the HCP in OVN because OVN is able to deliver the IP configuration for logical switch ports as the HCP uh, request reply and discovery. So we deliver that. Uh, this way, uh, and also we use a uh, IRP proxy, which is kind of something that you can configure uh, in OBS logical switch port, and there you can like like configure an IP address that is not known by the topology, but is this configuration is able to answer back with a specific MAC address. So it's kind of an alien IP address. You can even put there like a, a local link address, which of course is not going to be part of the topology, but uh, it will be able to answer. Uh, we implement it in OVN and its merge is going to be like delivered in 2nd of June. So with this in mind, uh, we're going to show a bit of pictures. Uh, three pictures, in fact. Uh, the first picture is what the topology has already. This is what OVN Kubernetes uh, configure on top of OVN. This is, we, we are not changing anything here for light migration. This is how it is, all right. So it has a pair of logical switches. Those logical switches are connected to a logical router, one per node. And then, in, then they are with a join switch, and a join switch is connected to a join router. So it's the typical sandwich of router switch, router switch. Okay, so the most important part here is uh, the IP address of, of Egresnet, uh, Egresnet Hub, which is going to be the IP address that we use for the point to point routing. All right. So now we are going to see uh, in the south part of the topology, which is the one that we modify in this POC. Uh, this is how it looks before the light migration. All right. So uh, in the top of the picture, we see the OVN cluster router, which is the join router that we have seen before uh, at the button of the picture. All right. So. Uh, what we have here and what, what we have configured is instead of using kind of subnet routing, we are using kind of point to point routing, meaning like we are matching exactly the IP address from the VM that we want to line migrate. Um, and we have a pair of configuration. We have one configuration for the egress traffic and another configuration for the ingress traffic. For the egress, we have the policy, and for the ingress, we have the route. For the policy, we see that it's matching the IP address of the VM. And what we see is like, OK, uh, if this is the IP address, then you have to go over the next hop, uh, dot two, which is the one for node one, because the VM is running in node one right now. All right. Then for the ingress traffic is kind of the opposite, but it's matching, this, matching the same IP address. When you see this IP address, which is the root prefix, uh, you go to the output port of the node one. All right, so they say node one is the, where the VM is running. And of course we are matching the destination IP. 
Uh, so this is the part, this is the point to point routine. Then we have uh, this stuff about how we are consistent in the destination, in the default the gateway address, and also in the in the neighbor cache, like the IRP, because for like migration to work properly, the MAC address for the default gateway uh, have to be the same. So there is no disruption at all, or, or very small. For that, that's why we are using IRP proxy. We configure IRP proxy in the logical switch ports of each node with exactly the same configuration. So it means like if the VM sends an IRP for this specific uh, address, which is kind of fake, it's not part of the topology, it returns back, it answers back with this MAC address. All right. Uh, in that same happen for the other node, exactly configure the same. So if the when the VM finishes like migration, uh, it will be able to have the same kind of answers for the IRP for the default gateway. All right. Next, what we do is uh, to configure the DHCP options in the logical switch port connected to the VM. All right, and then what what we have, what we do with that is what we implement. It implements like uh, some flows that will answer DHCP request for the for the for the VM with the address in the logical switch port, and also is the way that we deliver the default gateway from IRP proxy, and also the as DNS we use the kube DNS server. Uh, the rest of it is the typical kubeir architecture where we have like a beer launcher pod and in the pod we, this is the libber vm and we have the bridge binding and the important part here is like the primary interface of the pod has no address at all this is part of what we have to do for light migration because if we don't do so uh, after light migration this ip address can be very problematic uh, with the traffic so Next is what happens after line migration, all right? So as you see, IRP proxy is exactly the same. Uh, the HTTP options are exactly the same. The logical switch port address is exactly the same because the, the IP address has to follow the VM. Uh, and the only change that we do is changing the policy next hops. So we change to the dot three, which is node two next hop. And for the ingress, we change output port to node 2. And this is how it goes. OK, now we're going to show a light migration demo. It's quite short, but I'm going to show a pair of diagrams uh, to see what the demo is going to do. So the demo has same configuration with a pair of nodes. And in the infra node, which is the management, management cluster node, uh, management cluster nodes. Uh, we are running uh, uh, a little program we have created to test uh, one TCP connection that's called TCP proof. And it has client server, and the client is running as a pod inside the infra cluster. And the server is running uh, inside the hosted cluster in the VM that we are going to blindly rate. Then they connect over a unique TCP connection. And if the TCP connection is broken, the server goes down and everything fails. All right. Then after light migration, of course, what we do, we light migrate the VM and the connection has to be there. OK. Now uh, we're going to, I'm going to share the demo. All right. OK. So we are going, what we're going to see in the demo is uh, the latency of uh, of the connection of the traffic of the one TCP connection. And we will see that sign is not broken and is working. The TCP connection is not down. And we will see a spike uh, when the migration happens. OK. This is the latency between sending the message and receiving it back from the client to the server, all right? And as we see, we see the response time and the max. Then we are going to migrate. As you see, a pair of beer launcher pods appear there. 
One is in worker one and the other is in worker two. Now it's like migrating and it's copy and libvirt is copying the state from one VM from one node to the other. So both la both the launcher pods are running state. Now we see that we have a spike uh, because uh, it's in the middle of light migration. Uh, it's not totally seamless, but light migration has finished. And TCP connection is all right. And everything is uh, at least good enough for our requirements here. And, and that's it. OK, now Miguel is going to take over. Thank you, Kike. Um, yeah, so these are our conclusions. Like um, oh, the fact that we use the pods default network exclusively gives us a lot of features for free. Like uh, that's actually why I've, I've asked Jian Li in the presentation before, like are you using the default pod network for this? Because if so, we did something wrong. No, so by using this, we get access to Kubernetes services and that is something that we had as a, as a goal. It gives us like a hosted cluster network isolation. It's, as I said, it allows us to have services and these services are already implemented in Oven Kubernetes. Like they exist today and you can use them. And uh, the type of services that are implemented are like node port, load balancer, cluster IP. This gives us load balancing, uh, virtual IPs, <coughs> those things. And that's like a pretty powerful uh, that allows for pretty powerful use cases. And then the other thing I'd like to point out is that by using point to point routing, what Kika explained to us before, this is what enables us to have like consistent IPs and gateway configurations during the migration. And that's what allows the established TCP connections to survive the live migration of the Kubernetes node from one of the infra cluster nodes to another one without disrupting the workloads. Well, it disrupts a little bit, but the TCP connection survived it, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, pretty sure this can still be improved a little bit, but uh, well, this 800 uh, milliseconds is not as bad as it looks. Uh, now, the next steps for this, uh, well, I'd like to refer that of everything that Kika showed here, the only thing that was merged was the R proxy thing into Oven project. In Oven Kubernetes, all we did with this work is we have like, uh, or Kika has actually, like I was just like, let's say his brainstorming buddy on most of this, all the crit crate and work was his. What we have so far is we know exactly what features we need to request from Oven Kubernetes. So we now have uh, prioritized RFEs and we know exactly what to ask. Because again, we started with a set of assumptions. We wanted to do something. We found out that that idea was not going to work because it did not fulfill all of the objectives. We repivoted and this is what we came up with. And uh, again, now we know what to ask for. Everything is prioritized and uh, I hope that in a release or two, this thing gets accepted, gets merged, and is usable by the broader community. Uh, next slide, just before we finalize, I just want to give a holy shout out to a few people that helped a lot during this, um, well, this proof of concept. And yeah, this concludes our talk, and we now have a few moments or minutes to answer any questions you may have. So I'm first going to look at the public Q and A. There's nothing there. I'm going to look there. at. Yeah, I'm All seeing. Right. I'm seeing. Couple in the general. Uh, yeah, uh, the graph is pretty cool. How have you created it? So Kika, this one's for you. Uh, well, yes, uh, Google Draw did the magic. <laughs> nothing fancy there. Like it's, it's the paint version of Google, I suppose. In fact, I'm colorblind, so I choose like very weird colors. Sorry about that. Okay, next question. What type of binding is this called when pod ETH has no address? So this actually happens for bridge binding today when you do not have um, IPAM configured. So if you do not have an IP, if you don't request IPAM, you will not have an IP address on the pod. 
that's exactly what this is. But um, specifically, what Kiket did here was he changed the Oven Kubernetes code. Like, please correct me if I'm wrong, but he changed the Oven Kubernetes code for the CNI part to not configure the IP address. And the virtual machine will request an IP address via the HTTP. And there's a couple of flows on installed on Oven on well on the Open V switch that will reply with an address. Is that is approximately like this, right? Yeah, exactly this. I mean, the problem is like maybe we can do that at beer launcher, right? But then we have like a little time window where we have the address, and then we remove it in beer launcher, and this can be problematic. So we have directly go for the goal and just instruct OBM Kubernetes to not set the address, and that's it. And and the the pot interface we will not have the address from the beginning. Okay, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I guess this only <laughs> makes, let's say, our value proposition more important. Like this comment about, ask me how many Jupyter Hub notebook virtual machines and climate science gets interrupted when we shut down our multiple OpenStack instances simply to patch. Yeah, that's literally what we're trying to avoid. Like this entire thing. <laughs> is just to kind of minimize that uh, that issue. 